Like many woodworkers, I've got a lot of hand tools. And lately, I've just been hanging them wherever I see a space on the wall. So today I want to give them a home more centered in the wood shop, so I'm not climbing over hoses to get to them. So let's get to work on Timber Biscuit. So like any project, this one starts with choosing my lumber and milling it down. And for this one, I'm going to be using some four quarter walnut and some four quarter cherry. So here I'm just having a good time milling it down to its rough thickness, which is a little over five eighths of an inch for my walnut and a little over three quarters of an inch for my cherry. And this just gives me a little bit of breathing room when it comes to sanding and hand planing later on. I want to be able to finesse the fit. And if I go for the exact thickness now, it's going to give me issues later. So once I finish skip planing my boards, I could go over to the joiner, check it for square, and then join a clean edge on them. And for the design of this till I'm making, this is especially important. Because if any of the boards are a little too long, a little wide, or a little out of whack, it's going to be compounded on every edge. So I'm trying to shoot for perfection here, or at least within a tolerance of a 64th of an inch. So here I'm ripping my boards down, again giving them that 64th of an inch extra space so that I can plane back to that nice clean edge by hand later on. I mean, what's the point of having hand tools if you don't use them, right? So earlier I mentioned that I'm using cherry and walnut for this project. And that's because I'm in the process of updating my whole shop using those two lumbers. And I've got a really large project in the works right now, as you'll be able to see by this huge stack of lumber behind me. But that's for the next video, so let's get back to work on this one. Oh, and as always, if you guys want the plans for this till, just let me know down in the comments, and I'll post it in the community as well as the description when it's available. Just know that your plans may need to be adjusted a bit based on the dimension of your own planes. Though I did design this with that in mind, and I think it should fit most planes. Alright, so now that I have all my boards ripped to rough width, I can go ahead and cross cut them down to their final length. And I just used my miter gauge here with a stop so that I could really dial in that final length. Now my two side pieces are way too long for my miter gauge. So I'll go ahead and mark those out now, and then I'll use my cross cut sled to cut them out. One thing to keep in mind when you're marking things out with a tape measure is to try to use the same tape measure for your entire project. And this is because measurements can vary from tape measure to tape measure, so to be as consistent as you can, just stick with one. And before you ask, yes, I use Darth Vader's favorite measurement system in the shop. You know, Imperial. But I know that everyone in the world has a preference, so let me know what your favorite unit is down in the comments. Now that I've got all my measurements laid out, I could go ahead and trim down my sides over at the crosscut sled. And what I'm going to do here is just sneak up to that line so that I don't go over my cut. And when I'm done, I've got a neat stack of boards ready for the next step. Nice. Alright, so that next step is to go ahead and cut out all my curves for my vertical pieces. And to do that, I'm just going to use some templates that I carved out over at the CNC. So once I have my templates attached to my work pieces, I could then use my bandsaw to rough trim them out. And since we're going to be using the router table to flush trim these, here we're just shooting for about an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch of material, aiming for the lesser. Now this is my first time using this jig for any project, but basically what it does, it gives me a reference point to push my workpiece against when I'm cutting the curves. This way I don't have to think about going inside or outside my line, I just have to push it through the blade. And with my templates rough trimmed, I could bring them over to the router table to flush trim them. And to do that, I'll just use this beefy flush trim bit to get everything nice and smooth. Now the grain on these pieces does run in a few different directions, so that's where this compression bit really comes in handy. If you're interested in getting one for yourself, I'll leave a link down in the description. So once I have my initial templates all flushed out, I can take the left side of the till, attach it to the right side, and repeat the process. Again, I'm going to use my jig to cut a consistent clean edge, and then bring everything over to the router table and flush trim it out. Side note, just be careful routing end grain like this. Even with a compression bit, things can still get messy. Alright, so with the routing done, I could finally get some hand tool work in. So here I'm going to use my spoke shave to finesse those curves and give me nice smooth lines. And then from there I'm going to use my number 4 to clean up those edges. Now, it's really nice when a hand plane works, and what that really comes down to is just having a really sharp blade and a really flat bottom. I will say that the tool itself does make a marginal difference as well. In my experience, nicer tools give me a nicer finish. But you can still get exceptional results with something less expensive. But I know nobody wants to break the bank on one plane, so let me know what you think down in the comments. I feel like there's a common misconception in woodworking where people think, oh, if I had that tool, I could make it too. But when I first started woodworking, I didn't own a lot of tools. I was just ambitious in what I wanted to build and made it happen. So I think if you want to be a good woodworker, you just have to think outside the box. So with all my vertical pieces done, I can move on to the shelves. And I'm going to plane these a little less than my sides because I want to make sure that I have enough material to plane back to once the case is assembled. If you saw my perfect cabinet video, you already know what I mean. But if not, don't worry, we'll get to it here in a second. But hey, if you're enjoying this video, please give it a like. It really helps me a ton and allows the video to reach new people. Thanks for your support. All right, so the next step was to glue up the panel that was going to make my chisel backboard. And this is where the cherry comes into play. I'm using the cherry as an accent for the build so that it can get some contrast to the walnut and gives me something to pop off of. 
I just got some new chisels in, which is partially what's prompting this build, so this panel will contrast with them. So once I had a few parallel clamps on, I threw on a couple calls to keep things flat, and from there we can move on to the saw holder. Now I don't own a bunch of saws, but I want to give myself plenty of room for expansion in the future, so what I'm going to do is give myself 5 slots for traditional American saws, as well as 5 slots for Japanese pole saws. So what I'm doing here is just cutting the kerf in for those saw blades. And since the Japanese saws will sit vertically, I'll leave a larger section for those, and since the American push saws will lean in, I'll leave a smaller section for them. Some of the Japanese saws have a thin brace that runs along the spine, so I need to leave a little bit of a larger kerf for those saws. So I just use my calipers to take a measurement off the spine of mine, and here I'm cutting in that gap. Now not all these saws share the same width. Some of the blades are thicker, some of the blades are thinner. So I'm going to leave a few of the kerfs alone, this way I can trim them out later on when I get new saws. And since I'll be mounting the till using a French cleat, I cut in a small section of the vertical partition to give me clearance to mount it. Then from there it was on to laying out the joinery. And for the joinery on this one, I'm going to be using dominoes. Now in other cabinets I've used dados, stop dados, mortise and tenon, and dovetail joints. But for this one I'm using floating tenons because I have a ton of mortise and tenon joints coming on the next project, and I wanted to finish this one in a weekend. Plus, as many of you know, I love simplicity when it comes to design, so I think hiding the joint really accentuates that. And all that's to say, if you choose to build this project, you can use whatever joinery you like. So once I had spent a few hours laying out all my dominoes, I could finally start plowing in the mortises. And to do that, I'm just going to use a reference block I made to make sure that my dominoes lined up, and then plunge away. I love handy little jigs like this that lessen the amount of errors that you can make. For instance, if I know my block is lined up on the edges of my board here, then I know I'm not going to miss my placement. And hey, if you're enjoying this video and you want to see more like it, be sure to subscribe. This way you won't miss the mark or another video again. And trust me, you don't want to miss the next one. Yeah, I'm looking at you. All right, back to work. Actually, with that, the largest portion of this cabinet joinery is done. Now, because the majority of this cabinet is 5 8 in thickness, I didn't just use a standard size domino. So I'm going to trim down my dominoes for the mortise depth that I had to use. And I'll just do that over at the bandsaw by inserting a domino into a cut mortise and using the scrap to hold it while I trim it down. From there I could start addressing my cherry boards, and I'm going to start by ripping down the panel that we glued up earlier. This will give me both the backer panel for my chisels, as well as the board I'm using for my French cleat. So once I had my panel ripped down to rough width, I could use my miter gauge which was set to my previous setting to cut it to final length. And then from there I'll tilt my blade to 45 degrees, or thereabouts, and rip it down the center so that I can create my two French cleat pieces. And the reason these don't have to be 45 degrees is because the angles are automatically complements of each other. And then with that, I can cut in the remaining joinery for the backer panel and the French cleat. And just as a side note, if you do choose to use dominoes, make sure that you pay attention to which side of the board your domino is going in. You're going to want to make sure that your joints line up at the end, so align the faces accordingly. Next, it was time for some glue. And for this case, I'm going to assemble the shelves and vertical partition with dominoes first. This way I don't have to worry about them when I'm doing the final assembly later on. I found that this really alleviates a lot of the stress and tension that comes up for a full glue up. So while those get set up, let's get to work on that chisel rack. So here I'm just trimming down one more piece of cherry, about 4 inches smaller than the interior width of the case. This should give me plenty of room for about 10 chisels as well as my mallet. Now if you have more or less chisels in your set, you may need to adjust the width of these holes, but this also gives me some room for expansion, so I think 10 is a good number. Now I mentioned earlier that I just got a set of new chisels, and mine are the western style, but I also know people love the Japanese style, so let me know what your preference is down in the comments. So once I had my holes all marked out, I could use my drill press and a Forstner bit to plunge all the holes. And my holes are going to vary slightly because I have a set of bench chisels as well as a set of mortising chisels. So next I could take the whole piece over to the bandsaw to take a small slit out of the front. This will allow the chisels to clear the shelves so that they can easily come in and out of the rack. Just make sure these gaps are wide enough to fit the neck. Otherwise, like a shirt on Barry Bonds, they just won't fit. So once I had all my gaps cut, I could take the whole piece over to the router table and put a round over on the inside. Now, you could do a round over or a chamfer here. I decided to go with a round over because that's the edge treatment that I'm going to carry through the remainder of this case. Doing this allows the chisels to nestle into the holder rather than sitting proud. The socket or bolster is usually tapered, so this makes for a nice complement. Since the bearing on my round over bit is a little too wide to accommodate the small slits, I just decided to cut that edge treatment by hand. Plus, it gives me a good excuse to break in these new chisels. And check that out. Like a glove. Alright, so my next step was to cut in the joinery to attach the rack. And to do that, again, I'm going to turn to the domino. And I'll just use three dominoes here, which will give me plenty of strength, since the chisels don't really weigh all that much. Another option here might be screws from the backside if you ever feel like you're going to need to alter the holder. 
I don't feel like that's going to be an issue, so I didn't worry about it here. Yeah, that'll do. All right, so next it was time for the edge treatment. And again, to do that, I'm just going to use a round over bit. And here I'm only rounding over the bottom side of all my shelves and the inside of all my side pieces. I didn't put an edge treatment on the vertical partition because I think it works well as is and the round overs just don't make sense there. And the idea behind putting a round over on only one edge adds a little visual interest and drama to the piece. At least that's the plan. Edge treatments can really make or break a piece. A subtle round over here or a chamfer I think looks really good, but an OG bit may not be the best solution. Again, that's personal preference, but I think you guys get the idea. So with that wrapped up, I could turn my attention to the saw portion of the till. Now, I'm going for a real minimalist design on this piece, so I don't really want big saw holders impacting that. My solution for holding the western style saws in place is to use some magnets. So what I needed to do was drill a couple of shallow holes and then take my stick over to the table saw to trim out a few blocks. In total, I'll need five for the five western style saw curves. And then from there, I can use some CA glue to glue in a couple of rare earth magnets. Now, if for whatever reason these magnets don't work out in the future, I can always go back and add a thin strip to the lower area of the handle on the saw till. But in my testing, I think these are going to do just fine. However, if that changes, I'll definitely let you guys know. So once I had all my pieces sanded up to 220, I go ahead and start gluing things together. And the first thing I'll glue on are my magnetic blocks. Again, for this, I'm just going to use some CA glue and activator. Then from there, we could get on to assembling the rest of the case. And for that, I'm going to use Type Bond Extend so that it gives me a little bit more open time and the catalyst for that won't alter my cherry, giving me those ugly red glue lines. We've talked about this before, but just as a quick refresher, sometimes Type Bond 2 can leave a red glue line at your joint seam when working with cherry, so this will help us avoid that. So if those types of tips are helpful, the videos you see here are valuable and you want to support the channel, I'd like to invite you to join my Patreon. There you'll get discount codes on plans and merch, an invite to the Discord server, plus a few free welcome gifts. And I'm constantly trying to figure out new ways to get you guys involved with one-on-ones and meetups. So if that's something you're interested in, check out the link in the description. And if you can't today, no pressure. But to those of you who've already joined, your contribution allows me to continue to do this. So thank you so much for your support. It means the world. All right, so once I planed down the front of the case, all I had to do was toss on my mark and start applying the finish. For this one, I'm going to be using the same penetrating oil that I used on the tool cabinet from last video. I think it really brings out the natural warmth in the cherry and walnut. Plus, it adds a little bit of protection. Though, let's be honest, this thing's designed to hold tools that are designed to cut wood, so it might take a little abuse. And as always, I'll leave links to the tools and items I've used in this video in the description below. Just full disclosure, I do get a few pennies if you do decide to buy, but I would never recommend anything that I don't actually use myself. Alright, so with the finished dry and my French cleat attached to the wall, I could go ahead and mount the till. Now, I did paint the back of my wall black to add a little bit more contrast, and I think it looks pretty sweet. But what was even sweeter was finally getting all these tools in one place on the wall. I can honestly say I don't think there's anything I would change about this till. For right now, it suits my needs perfectly. It allows for all my tools to live in one place so I'm not tripping over things in the shop trying to get to them, and honestly, it just looks really clean. I think that also says something about the tools it holds. They serve a purpose, just like this till. Yeah, you could make multiple tills to hold all these tools, but I don't think I need that. At least, not right now. So I think this all-in-one solution is the way to go. So if you enjoyed this video and you want to see other solutions like this, be sure to subscribe. Check out this video over here next, and like always, I'll see you next time.